on her way to get my rings cut off. Not happy about it. But <laughs> can't change the size of the knuckle. Why do I need to get my rings cut off? Oh, we have so much to catch you up on. Let's go down that road. Hello, faithful people. I'm Orlean. I'm Jerry. And my choices were to either have a jeweler remove the rings or when I go in for surgery. And that's a whole big story that we haven't told you about. Partly because we didn't have all the answers. We still don't. But we're going to tell you what we have so far. And it's a whole lot more as of last week than what we had prior to that. Let's just back up and start you from the beginning. Turning. Right. Otherwise I might have been able to get it, but I can't do them both at the same time. So. Yeah, I had a lot of people telling me I, I could put ice on it. I'm trying to take the You can't down. you can if it's not swollen, but it's right. swollen too much yeah. to do that. Yeah. And that's hard. Yeah. Too many years of gardening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they should have been made bigger a long time ago. Yeah, I know. It wasn't a necessity until now. Yeah, but what if you woke up one day and your finger was blue? Yeah, well, <laughs> I'd yeah. be bad. I could, I could still see light <clears throat> through, you know? I mean, I could still see them still. I could, I could fit some like a piece of paper underneath it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a little too small. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm, this was a second setting for me too because my first setting, it was just the diamond was just too vulnerable and it was always don't don't pull oh, okay. it. Don't help. Okay. Let me get them big enough so we can get it over here. Now. I guess that was a little don't, tight. Don't, nope. Don't pull. Okay. You pull them up, can't you? Okay. I don't want to do that. Help me. Just, just, just sit. <laughs> there. 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 Oh, look at this kid. Yeah. But that will go away. Oh my God! It will come back. Okay. It, will back in. it will be okay. And it will fill back in. Um, okay, you want to say a few words? No, I just want you to take a, a picture of that. That is Social really Got the rings off. Got the silicone ring to replace it for a while. It's gorgeous. Mm. Hmm. The word is out that something's going on with me, which affects both of us, of course. You've probably wondered where we've been for a while. It's been a couple months since I put up a video, which is really not the norm for us at all. It's high time we tell you what's going on. When things first started, the only people we shared with were our kids, siblings, Gary's mom, and a few friends. Well, one of those friends is a pastor's wife, and she asked if she could ask for prayers on my behalf from other pastor's wives, and I said, sure. I thought, you know, we're talking maybe a few here, right? No, she shared it to a Facebook page of over 800 pastor's wives, and when we started getting phone calls, emails, texts uh, from people who, who knew us that saw it. Uh, different churches started saying, hey, we had a prayer for you today in church because their pastor's wife saw it and they knew there was a connection to their church. Oh my gosh. Um, the word really spread. We have been very thankful for all the prayers and all the contacts and everything that we've been receiving from everyone. We really appreciate it. The prayers are incredible. Uh, we're going to tell you a lot today. This is going to be a long one. You may want to take uh, notes. 
the reason I'm doing this is partly to let the rest of you know what's been going on, but also to maybe help other women who have similar things that are wondering what's going on. And I'm going to let you know my experience. We had hoped to be able to do this video on the beach as a beach walk thing again, a walk and talk. But the fires from Mexico are making the air quality here in Corpus Christi very uncomfortable and nasty. This video is for anyone who is a woman, is married to a woman, has a sister, a mother, a cousin, a friend, whoever. I'm hoping that my experience is going to help someone else. There is currently no screening for this particular kind of cancer. And we don't know for sure that I have cancer yet. That's why we have been putting off putting this video together because different things are happening and changing and we aren't sure about anything. But there are some things we do know and we're going to share with you some of the risk factors for this particular kind of cancer, some of the warning signs or symptoms. I'm also going to share with you some of the regrets that I have, things I wish I'd known about that I would have probably done differently had I known. Gary will be speaking later. I'm going to be doing most of the talking. Uh -huh. That's not really anything new with most of our videos, but he is going to say a few words too, so you might want to stick around for that, if nothing else. <laughs> um, our teeth are done. And that was a good thing. I'm not going to go into the whole thing about the insurance mess and all the other stuff that happened. But the same insurance broker that got us um, the better insurance plan through Humana and was able to save us some money on the insur on the dental stuff also got us uh, doctor appointments. Now, when we were in Wisconsin for many years, we had a doctor. We each had a doctor. Then we moved to Illinois for five years and had a doctor down there, although we never saw the doctor. We just saw a nurse practitioner every time. And then we moved back to Wisconsin when we decided to m get on the road and start living full-time RV. We never got another doctor established there. We've had different times where we tried to get a doctor established in Wisconsin, and we were told every time, well, we're booking 11 months from now, a year from now, 10 months from now. Even when I had to go to the ER for something one time, unrelated to what I'm going through now, the doctor said, you need to see a doctor within a week. We found a doctor and tried to get an appointment, and she said, well, we're booking 11 months from now. And I said, no, you don't understand. I need to see a doctor within a week. And she said, well, I'm sorry, we can't get you in until 11 months from now. So that's been our experience and our dilemma. So that same insurance broker, her name is Marie, Marie, our angel on earth here. She has done so much for us. She helped me find a chiropractor that took Medicare patients. I couldn't find one on my own. She found one for me. And this woman is incredible. Anyway, Marie also got us doctor appointments and got the ball rolling on different things. So on that first initial visit, it was kind of a meet and greet appointment with the doctor that day. And when we were all done, we did like vitals and things like that mm -hmm. and she took our blood work and everything, and then um, which all came back great. And she reviewed the vitamins and supplements that were on. She thought they were all very good, excellent, and we were not on any medications at all, um, just supplements and vitamins. So she thought we were pretty good, you know, in that way. But she said, do you have anything that you're concerned about today? And I told her. About a year ago, actually now, it's about a year and a half ago almost, I started spotting two or three days a month. I thought that was weird. I went through menopause when I was 47 and I had no issues whatsoever. I didn't have hot flashes. I didn't have night sweats. I didn't have any of those things that a lot of women have when they go through menopause. And I went 18 and a half years before I started having this postmenopausal bleeding. 
I kept looking things up online, trying to figure out what's going on, what is this? There were two things. One was vaginal atrophy or dryness was one big one, and then the other one was endometrial carcinoma. I'm going to let Gary hold this. It's been so long since we've done a video, I don't know where my tripod is. We have looked everywhere for it. So if this gets a little shaky, it's because our arms are getting tired. Anyway, um, yes, I started looking up all the different risk factors for endometrial carcinoma. And I'm going to tell you what those are later in the video, so make sure you watch all the way to the end. But um, I only had one thing, and that was my age. I was over 50. So I thought, well, it must be something else. So when I told the doctor that I had this bleeding thing going on, um, and it's not, it wasn't really bleeding, it was more spotting, and it wasn't every day, it was just once in a while, and she just very calmly said, well, let's just order a, a transvaginal ultrasound and, and rule out endometrial carcinoma. I thought, okay, I've heard that words before because I'd seen that when I looked things up. Um, so she did order that. Um, the uh, doctor appointment was on February 20th, and I checked our portal to see what our blood work was all about, how that all came out, and to look for the referral, and there was nothing coming up. So I called about a week after that and um, asked about that, and that evening there was a referral for radiology to do the transvaginal ultrasound. I had that on March 13th, and one of the first things that the tech was asking me was, have you ever been on any hormones? And I said, no. I had no idea what they were seeing when they were doing, there was two women that were doing the, the scan, and then she's looking at things and she's telling the other one to take a picture of this, take a picture of that. And some of the things I took pictures of were healthy things, like our, my ovaries and things like that. But I had no idea what they were seeing otherwise. And then she wanted to know, you've never been on tamoxifen? I said, no. She goes, okay. And then I got the results back that night on my portal. And it said, highly suspicious of endometrial carcinoma. There was a small mass. Well, I guess I, I, I don't know what, how, what is considered a big mass. or a, It's about the size of a walnut is what we think. And it's at the top of the uterus. So then after that, I was ordered a pelvic MRI. And when I checked the portal, said the same thing. They suspected endometrial carcinoma. There was also a secondary obstruction at the bottom of the uterus that they could not get a good picture of. So we don't know what that is yet. And so then the next step was to be referred to, well, I was referred to at OBGYN here in Corpus Christi. And that's the thing that I'm kind of regretting right now. The day before... I was supposed to meet with the OBGYN, which took two weeks to get in to see her. I got a phone call from my primary doctor wanting to know if I'd be willing to go. Actually, it was the nurse wanting to know if I would be willing to travel to San Antonio to see a gynecological oncologist. And I said, well, does that mean I'm not supposed to go to the, the OBGYN tomorrow? And she didn't seem to know about that. So there was some lack of communication there. I don't know if I was supposed to be telling them what was going on. I was given a referral. I called. I made the appointments. I'm not sure how that all got messed up, but um, I tried to get an answer from the doctor and she never called me back, wondering why she was referring me to a gynecological oncologist out of town and the nurse practitioner referred me to the OBGYN. Your hand getting tired? Oh, of course. <laughs> we have to keep taking breaks so he can shake his hand out a little bit. Okay, so uh, the OBGYN. 
was not the right doctor for me. She may be a great OBGYN for younger women, for expectant moms, for women trying to get pregnant, for delivering babies, but she was not the right one for me. Um, I did not know what I was going for that day. I was never told it was going to be a, to get a biopsy. I was not told that. Um, so she tried to get a biopsy. She had the wrong size equipment. I don't think she lubricated things enough. It was extremely painful. She got frustrated. And she was not very gentle. Um, there was just a whole lot of factors there. The, the little tiny skinny tube she was trying to put in me was much smaller than the um, the wand that they used for the transvaginal ultrasound. And I'm sorry if this is too much information, but I'm just trying to help you here so you don't have to go through what I did. I don't know what she was doing, but it was very painful. She decided as long as she was there that she was going to also get a pap smear of the cervix. So, all right. And then she just finally quit and she just couldn't get in there. She was she just was frustrated. So she told me to cancel the PET scan that I had for the following week. Now, this was on April 4th. April 10th was supposed to be a PET scan, and she told me to cancel it because she was going to do a surgical DNC where I would be put under and she would be able to get the biopsy that way. On the 9th of April, we met with her to do a pre-op, and I had a ton of questions for her because I was very disillusioned by her. I was being respectful the day on the 4th when she was talking to me in front of staff members and nurses and um, other patients. We were out by the front desk at the time when she was telling me that what was going to be happening. I said, don't you think that the PET scan will show if there's cancer and if it has spread anywhere? And she said, what I'm going to do is going to be a better thing. And I'm like, there was just a lot of things that were not sitting well with me with this particular woman. She, like I said, she may be, a, I'm not going to say her name because she may be a great OBGYN, but she was not the right person for me. And it was an extra step that I would not have had to have done. All right, we had to switch hands again. I'm holding it again. Oh, and the air conditioning. It's going to get steamy in here soon. Yes, we had to shut the air conditioning off just now. I'm holding the camera again give Gary a break. All right. So we went in on the 9th for the pre-op. I had a list of questions. That is one very important tip that we were given is write down everything. The other very important tip is never go alone. Gary went with me. We had talked about a lot of things prior to the, to the appointment. He knew what experience I had the first time on the 4th. Um, I think she was being very honest and straightforward, but I... I don't know. There were there were things that I was asking her about that she tr said that she could not have done any other way, but I was told by other people that she could have. So what she did manage to do was get enough of a biopsy from the bottom of the uterus. She never got to the, the mass at the top, but she was able to get enough at the bottom. And she was waiting for the pathology report to come back. It had not come yet by that, by our appointment that day. We came home. For those of you that have seen on our Facebook page, I put a, a pictures of the burned up fire uh, RV that was just one door away from us. We had one RV in between us and the one that burned up. Um, that's on our Facebook page. And during that time, with all the commotion going on, fire trucks and everybody from the park was coming to watch and everything going on, I got a phone call from the OBGYN telling me that the DNC for the 10th was now canceled. She was going to refer me 
to a gynecological oncologist in either San Antonio or Houston. Where did I want to go? Well, Houston has MD Anderson Cancer Center. It is the number one cancer center in the United States. It is world renowned. Uh, people from all over the world come to MD Anderson. We are about four hours away from there. We are two hours away from San Antonio. But everybody had told me prior to this, anticipating something, people had already been telling me, go to MD Anderson. So I told her that. She said she would get the referral in. What little bit that she did get, she told me verbally that there were cancer cells. That was the first that shook me up a little bit. Otherwise, I'd been pretty calm through all that, really not afraid of anything, but just hearing the word that there were cancer cells kind of shook me up a little bit. Um, had a friend here at the park. She's now left, um, but um, she was a surgical nurse, and we were pretty good friends, and I went to her right away and was asking her questions about things, and she really calmed me down and just got me thinking straight again. She's very good at that. So the DNC was called off, the PET scan was called off, and I was told the following day, on the 10th, the nurse called me from the OBGYN office, and she said, your referral to MD Anderson is in, wait 24 hours, and then call them. And make sure you call them, because you have abnormal cells. And I said, I was told that they were cancer cells. And she said, well, the pathology report, the written report says abnormal cells, which means precancerous. Again, she did not get that sample from the top mass. She got it from the bottom of the uterus. So we don't know. I know this is going to be a long video, and I'm really sorry, but there's just so much to cover, and I just really want your experience to be better than mine. <clears throat> All right, MD Anderson, did. I did not have to wait 24 hours to call them. They called me within about four hours after getting the paperwork and everything and the referral. And we went through the insurance. We went through all those kinds of type things, preliminary things, and then she said, all right, do you want the first available doctor or do you have a specific one in mind? Anyone that I know that has been to MD Anderson, including women that have been there for things such as this, told me different doctors' names and they all loved them. And I thought with the sterling reputation that MD Anderson has, and wanting to get in as soon as possible, I chose to go with the first available doctor. And the first available doctor was Dr. Solomon. And my appointment was set for April 23rd. How's your arm? Okay, so far. All right. So April 23rd was, um, this was on April 9th. No, this was on April 10th. So I had to wait two, over two weeks before I could get in. But in the meantime, there was a lot of paperwork that needed to be done, a lot of online stuff, um, legal stuff, I mean, just all kinds of things that I was doing with MD Anderson in the meantime. I had to get my scans um, on a digital disc to be able to take with me to the appointment. So we had to go to radiology for that and get that. We did that. Um, and then... Gary got a bug. Well, it was a cold. It wasn't just a bug. Yes. And it wasn't a good cold. It was a nasty one. Yes. And, uh, and so on day, I think I had gone like seven or eight days, and he was still having this cold, and I was still feeling pretty good, and I was out every day walking and everything to stay away from him. <laughs> from getting sick and the day before my appointment on the 22nd of April I started getting a scratchy throat I thought crap I'm getting it I just you just know you're just in fact we're still not completely over it but we think that we went from having the colds to doing the whole this 
whole air quality thing that's going on here and the pollen has been very high here too. So we're not sure, we don't think we don't have the colds anymore, but we're pretty sure we've got still got stuff that's not we're not a hundred percent back yet. But we're not contagious anymore. No. Yeah. No. Because everybody's coughing and hacking yeah. everywhere because mm -hmm. we all have allergies. Anyway. So then on the, they, they had to see me. We couldn't do a video call. We couldn't do anything like that. She had to physically see me. So they changed the date to the following Tuesday, the 30th of April. I was so grateful they were able to do it within a week that it didn't have to be dragged out for another two or three weeks or something. That was a wonderful thing that happened. Um, and in the meantime, I ended up getting worse. My worst day was the day that I would have gone to MD Anderson on the 23rd. I had sore throat. I was coughing. I was sleeping the whole time. It was just... I was very sorry. That was a miserable thing. It's like, mm, yeah. Yeah. And then our anniversary was the 25th of April, so we spent it coughing and hacking together. Mm. It was so romantic. Very unique. Yes. In the meantime, with all of this going on, I kept checking my portal for the OBGYN office to see what she wrote about that day on the 4th, to see what she wrote about everything on the 9th, the 10th. There was never anything in there. I never saw the first pathology report at all. Um, so I never, I never got to see any of that. But interestingly, I got a letter from her telling me that my pap smear came back normal. See you in three years. When I have the hysterectomy, I'm going to be having the cervix removed and the uterus and the ovaries and the fallopian tubes. Possibly some lymph nodes, hopefully not. On April 30th, we left the RV um, here at the RV park. Gary's been serving a church here since mid-November. We were supposed to leave the first part of April. Decided, oh, we're, we're month to month, middle of the month to middle of the month. I oh, might as well stay till the middle of April. And then all this other stuff happened. And so now here it is the end of April and we were still here. Um, but we left the RV because it was supposed to just be a one day thing. But nobody could really give us a straight answer on that either. It said to plan two to three hours for your first appointment with MD Anderson, but allow for two to three days. So we packed a couple overnight bags, extra food, things like that, and then we headed up to MD Anderson in Houston. MD Anderson is huge, by the way. Uh, there are several campuses in Houston area, Houston region. The one that we went to was Mays Clinic downtown, and that one is, I think, attached to the hospital, uh, but they have other locations throughout Houston. We saw the nurse practitioner who did an interview. She asked me all kinds of questions and everything. Then I told her about the experience with the OBGYN, why we didn't get a better biopsy, and then she went out, talked to the doctor. Dr. Solomon came back in with the nurse practitioner and they both did, um, well, the, dirt, the doctor did an exam. It did not hurt. She just was so, it was such a different experience. She didn't take any more sample or try to get another any more sample because MD Anderson did their own pathology report kind of as a second opinion on the tissue that was collected on April 4th from the OBGYN and she said that they knew enough that there were abnormal cells so their pathology department agreed with the first one that there are abnormal cells again this is just from the bottom of the uterus never got to the mass so we're not sure what's going on but I asked her because the pathology report from MD Anderson suggested getting more tissue for a better diagnosis. And she said, well, we can do that after it's out. I'm like, oh, that's what I wanted to do a month ago. 
But that's the difference between going to an OBGYN or a gynecologist and going to a gynecological oncologist. That's the difference. And not only is she a gynecological oncologist, she's also the surgeon. So she's going to do the whole thing, go all the way through. Afterwards, we did a consult with her, and she seems very confident. Of course, we won't know for sure, but she seems very confident that everything has been contained to the uterus from the, the two scans I had done and uh, everything and my overall health and everything else, the blood work, everything. Um, she said that all I needed that day was to have an EKG, which came back great, um, a chest x-ray, which came back very good, even with the, having the coughing and everything else the week before, and blood work. And all of that came back very good. The day of the surgery, they're going to uh, put a dye in to see if any of the lymph nodes light up. And if the lymph nodes, any, any of them do, showing that there is cancer in those, they will take only those, they call them sentinel lymph nodes. I think so. Yeah. And so they will uh, remove those and if needed. Um, otherwise, she's going to do it laparoscopically because it's a faster recovery. She thinks because of my overall health that I should recover fairly quickly. Two weeks after the surgery, we will get the pathology report. And then um, six weeks after the surgery, I need to be seen by her just to make sure everything is good um, as far as the, the incisions and everything. She also feels that it is very likely that I will not need any further treatment. My prayer all along has been, and whenever anybody asks me what can I pray for, I've asked for three things. One, that it's not cancer. Two, if it is cancer, that it's all contained and that it all comes out with a hysterectomy. And that three, I don't need any other treatments afterwards. I don't need anything else. It's a done deal. We thank you so much for all of you who have been praying for us. Um, Please continue because we still don't know. We won't know till after the surgery what's actually up there or in there. Um, I'm going to go over the risk factors that there are for endometrial carcinoma, as well as things you can do to prevent it. And we're going to have Gary tell you some things too. So hang in here. I, this, I know this is long, but we're going to try to get through the rest of this fairly quickly. We're going to be moving to an RV park. We're going to be pulling out, moving to an RV park. We've been here six months. It's the longest we've ever been any place from one at, well, in one place at a time. Oh my gosh. Uh, so we're going to be moving on the 21st. Um, my pre-op is the 23rd and my surgery is May 24th. And this all started back in February. I'm going to tell you the risk factors, and then we're going to have Gary say a few things about his thoughts on some things. I want you to know that I feel normal, except for this allergy thing. But other than that, we've been getting out, we walk, we do our normal things. I have had no pain. I would not even know anything was wrong if it hadn't been for the spotting. And that's something that you need to know. So keep watching. And through all of this, I really haven't been afraid of anything. I'm going to find out if Gary's been. He hasn't really said that he has. But we know that God is in control. And, um, I mean, to bring us to Corpus Christi, so close to Houston, and I swear there's never been so many nurses in a church as there has been in this one that he's been serving over the winter. And also in the RV park, the number of people that we have encountered that are in the medical field, it's like, I had right away from the beginning, before I even saw the doctor the first time, I was like, I think we're in a good place. So it was all part of God's plan. Anyway, I uh, just wanted to be assure you that I am really feeling quite well um, and uh, no pain and not afraid. I got a little frustrated with some of the process, but hopefully this video is going to help you so you don't have to go through that. Okay, the risk factors. I'm going to read these so that I can stay on track and don't go off on tangents here. 
Um, number one, the biggest cause of endometrial carcinoma is obesity. Um, the information I'm going to give you is from the American Cancer Society, it's from MD Anderson, it's from Mayo Clinic, and Cleveland Clinic. So I've got, these are all coming from very established um, resources. One of the first things that the doctor asked me when she saw me was, have you lost a lot of weight? This was after the first scan was done, and I said no. And the tech also asked me that when I had the the ultrasound, that, that first scan, she asked me if I'd lost a lot of weight, and I said no. I've always maintained about this same weight all my whole, pretty much my whole adult life, unless I was pregnant. <laughs> then I was a little more. Um, okay, the second thing is um, some things that affect hormone levels, such as taking estrogen without taking progesterone. So it's important that if you are on hormone treatment that you're taking estrogen and progesterone at the same time. Um, I never did either one. Like I said, when I went through menopause, I didn't have any, any really, any responses to that at all. I got, it was a breeze going through that. The perimenopause, the 10 years prior to that, all that 10 years before that was never knew what was going on, but actual menopause was fine. As it turns out, if the two together are used, it can decrease your chances of getting endometrial carcinoma, but it can increase your chances of getting breast cancer. So you have to kind of weigh those two out. If you started menstrual cycles before age 12, I was close to 12 when I started, and going through menopause in your later 50s is another um, thing that increases your chances. Women who have never been pregnant or cannot get pregnant. Um, I had four children. Tamoxifen. Remember I said that the tech asked me if I had ever taken any hormones or if I had been on tamoxifen. The reason is because um, tamoxifen is used for treating breast cancer, but it can increase your chances of getting endometrial carcinoma. Another one is if you've ever had ovarian tumors, specifically, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, granulosa cell tumor. And those can lead to endometrial carcinoma. Your age, if you're over 50, that's the only one I had. And I'm well over 50, um, and it just took a while. High fat diet is another one. Women with type 2 diabetes, which is more common in women who are overweight and less active. And this one is women who have had breast cancer or ovarian cancer are at an increased risk of getting endometrial carcinoma. Incomplete pregnancies, such as miscarriage or abortion, particularly chemical abortions, afterwards if they have not had a DNC to make sure everything is clean and clear and that everything came out. That also puts you at risk. Now I'm gonna let Gary speak. And after that, I'm gonna tell you what you can do to decrease your chances of getting endometrial carcinoma. So here's Gary. It certainly has been a different year uh, being here in Corpus and the relationships at church, the relationships here at the RV park pretty typical of our experiences uh, traveling and serving different churches in different areas. Uh, the people have been great. The relationships have been wonderful. The time here has gone quickly, even though it's been six months. Yeah. Uh, we did not intend to conclude our time here this way at all, as Orlean explained. And our, as far as what I'm going through, I, I'm not really scared. I don't think I've ever been really scared, troubled, concerned, but not really scared mm -hmm. yet. And we'll see how that goes. Frustrated? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, very frustrated with the way things have gone. Uh, grateful uh, that we've had so much support from so many people and also the, the many, many prayers that have been said. Uh, you don't 
really know how valuable that is until you're going through something like this. And this is coming from a pastor who's done praying for a living. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and yet when it, it comes your way and you know they're talking to the Lord for you, that is really encouraging and uplifting. Uh, it's still hard being the one who observes rather than being the one going through it. Uh, always like to be the one who has the answers and the fixes. Maybe guys are like that, but you're like that too. Yep. <laughs> uh, and it's frustrating when you don't have the fix or the answers and you're just kind of waiting and wondering and praying and then God gives you an answer. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, so now we're looking forward to getting to this next step, getting to the 24th of May and getting through the surgery and then getting on into the recovery time, healing time, whatever is coming. And we know that God will bless it. Mm -hmm. uh, we just don't exactly know what the blessings will be. Right. So we keep praying. And, and oftentimes the things we pray for are so little compared to how God actually blesses you with something way bigger than you even imagined. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> Okay. So thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your encouragements. Mm. And um, thank God. Mm. We have gotten cards from people. Um, what was interesting, there was one card that we got from a church here in Corpus Christi that we didn't know anybody. But we played Bunko on Monday, or yeah, Monday nights, wasn't it? We played Bunko here throughout the winter at the RV park. And there was one woman named Judy. And I thought, well, I never knew her last name. I, and there was one Judy on this card. All the women wrote my name, spelled correctly, which doesn't happen very often, O-R-L-E-N-E. -E, and they all put their own little personal message on this card. And I thought, who are these people? What What is this? And finally, someone at the RV park said, why don't you... Well, I found out it was not the Judy that we were playing Bunko with from the other RV park that was coming over. So... Uh, well, the, the one woman said, well, there's a return address on there. Why don't you just see if they have a Facebook page or a website? So I did. And I saw a couple here from the RV park, Ed and Joy, who were in a lot of the pictures. And I thought, aha. Well, it turned out she wasn't there the day that they did the card. So her name wasn't on the card. But I just thought how incredible, blessed we are. And all the churches that Gary has served have all had prayers for us and all the people in those churches and then people that we don't even know and then the people from the RV park here and, and it's just been an incredible blessing. So really quick, here's some ways that you can prevent uh, getting it or at least in, decrease your chances. You should know that en endometrial carcinoma is a slow gradually growing cancer over months or even years. So I know, have no idea how long I've had this. 15 to 20 percent of women may not have any symptoms. You should know that because there are no screenings for this. Unusual bleeding, spotting, or discharge. Abdominal cramps. Those are the most common symptoms. So if you have anything like that, get it checked out ASAP. Um, surgery is the main treatment, and it consists of getting a hysterectomy. Here are the things you can do to decrease your chances. Um, one of the things that came up from a lot of people lately has been that it's going to get to a point where they are going to actually recommending to women that they get hysterectomies when they have when they're over their childbearing years and um, because there are so many cancers that can affect women that have to do with the reproductive system. Uh, ovar ovarian cancer is, a, is one of the worst. Um, endometrial carcinoma is one of the easiest to treat. So I'm very blessed that way to have that happen. Uh, we've been on an anti-cancer diet pretty much our, for years um, everything we do is anti-cancer, diet, lots of antioxidants, healthy foods, healthy eating, exercise. 
but sometimes things just happen. <clears throat> if you're overweight, lose it. Get help. Get into a support system. Um, have often heard so many people talk about Weight Watchers and other programs where you are accountable to other people in the group. Do it. Lose the weight. Um, number two, get active. You'll feel like getting more active as you lose the weight too. Exercise, even if it's just walking every day, it will decrease your chances of getting any a lot of cancers actually. Um, I thanked our 31 year old daughter for this because if you have a pregnancy in your mid thirties or in your somewhere in your thirties, uh, a later pregnancy can actually decrease your chances of getting endometrial carcinoma by 32%. I was 35 when I had her. So I was, uh, I, I thanked her for being my surprise baby. Um, being on a contrac contraceptive, like the pill, because you're getting the balance of hormones can actually um, decrease your chances, as well as wearing an IUD for um, contraceptive type of birth control. However, they can cause other health concerns. So you need to talk to the doctor and weigh out the pro and cons carefully. Eating healthier, focusing on eating more veggies and fruits, uh, avoid sugar as much as you can. Cancer loves sugar and sugar is added to so many things. Diet sodas are terrible. All the artificial sweeteners and things like that are not good for you at all. So they will they can lead to all kinds of cancers. Um, pancreatic cancer is one of them. And that's it. I'm going to just say thank you. Thank you if you watched this all the way to the end. Oh my gosh. Um, and I have to edit all this. Um, thank you for the prayers. Thank you for your patience. Um, we've seen people checking out our channel. There isn't anything new there in two months. We've seen people checking out our Facebook page, looking for things, answers. We've probably a figuring that eventually we'll get something on there. And here it is. Finally, you've been updated on what's going on. Um, so thank you for your patience and understanding on all of that. I do have some videos that I still want to get up. We did go to the USS Lexington tour. That was a four and a half hour tour. It's been a bear trying to edit that one. I don't know how I'm going to get that one up. I'm still going to get that. I'm trying to do that. Another one we went to was a South Texas Botanical Garden. We did that about two months ago. So the flowers are going to be a little different there. Hope to get that one up yet. Um, and we went to King's Ranch. Uh, we were treated from someone at the church who took us there. And I'm going to probably put that one on Facebook. Um, instead of making that into a video. We will have all kinds of updates coming up now too on everything. I will try to be more current with all of that so you will not be in the dark on all that anymore. And until next time, God, God bless. bless.